Okay, that's the last of our alarms for today. So our last session for today um, is our whip session. So we're gonna have a series of short five to 10 minute talks um, from folks. And so, and we do ask our folks to really try to stick to the five to 10 minutes because we have like seven or eight talks now lined up. Um, so I'm just gonna turn it over to folks to get ready. The schedule I'm gonna to try to follow is the schedule that's on the wiki page and we'll go roughly in order. So the first talk we have is Kevin Bowling talking about network stuff, dealing with IFLIB and the Intel drivers. So Kevin, if you're ready, I'll hand it over to you. Sure, uh, I'm ready to go. Okay, go for it. Um, how is the screen share? It's been a minute since I've done all this. It's working. Okay, um, so my name's Kevin Bowling. Um, I've been doing, uh, that's not what I wanna do. I've been working on FreeBSD network stuff for a while. Um, I've been away from it for about three years due to a job change, but um, I just noticed there was a large accumulation of bugs and wanted to get back into the, the mix here. Um, so I just have like a meta comment about this whole situation um, just so we can improve the, the state of FreeBSD networking, uh, especially where it concerns these things. Um, this is the IFLIB bug query, and this is the Intel networking bug query. Um, I've been trying to go through some of these and just kind of make sure that we have like good triage um, and qualify the bugs. Um, one thing I've found in particular is like, there's maybe like five actual if live bugs in here um, in this query. The rest of these are generally like driver bugs. And then on the Intel networking side, um, there's quite a few stale bugs in here. Like it's pretty hard to determine whether these things have carried over from the FreeBSD 11 and prior driver to the new one or not. Um, so when I started, I think the bug count was probably like 10 or 15 higher. I went through and just closed a bunch that were, didn't look like they were reproducible or actionable. Um, and then I've just been whittling through some of the other ones. Um, and then the, the final comment is just when we're working through this stuff, I would like to see a precision in language um, when we're talking about the bugs. Like, for instance, if, if there's a framework bug, um, that's a different problem than a driver bug. And, you know, as, as operating system engineers, we need to be precise in, in what we're talking about. Um, so the, in, in the vein of E1000, um, I went through and fixed uh, a bunch of bugs. Um, the first three had PRs. These were just, you know, going and finding stuff that was ready to go and um, getting approval from a source committer and uh, adding it to the tree. Um, the top one is show bad packets. This is like a debug feature of the hardware where you can see um, packets that don't generally pass the hardware criteria uh, for acceptance up through the stack. Um, for some reason, this was toggled on. I think that was just uh, when we were doing the initial work, uh, it got left left on and that should have never been in uh, head and the, the releases. Uh, so thanks to Franco of the Open Sense project for that. Um, there was another trivial bug where we had the wrong Mac min for LEM um, and a related problem to the buffer sizes, the packet buffer sizes. Um, Jeff Gibbons found this. This is an extremely old NIC, but it was a trivial patch. So it's just like, why not? Why not fix that? Um, so that uh, is in the tree now. And then um, there was a, the IGBVF interface uses a random Mac. Um, if you don't assign it from the, the PF side first, uh, it has to generate a Mac. So I just reincorporated um, this patch from, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce this name, Belave PA, uh, but, um, that is fixed in, in head as well. Um, all three of these have MFC'd to uh, stable 13 and stable 12. Um, Kyle Evans created a new interface for this random Mac um, 
to handle the case of like not having a host UUID. Um, so I'll, I'll go through the Intel drivers and update all that to use the, the, the correct KPI rather than an internal implementation. Um, then uh, this hardware multicast filter management was an interesting bug. Um, JTL reported this like a decade ago. Um, we just, we didn't handle a bunch of boundary conditions correctly. Like uh, the hardware has a, a limit of 128 filters. And when you go above and beyond that, you have to switch to promiscuous mode and then um, disable the, the hardware filter and let the, the BSD stack handle things. Um, so I looked at this, then looked at IXGBE and went and stole the, uh, the implementation from IXGBE. Um, that is also in head stable 13, stable 12. Um, I added support for uh, the three recent or future client platforms from Intel. Um, it's good to get those things in early because you know the FreeBSD release cycle is usually like six to 12 months out. Um, so we wanna get those things in uh, as early as possible so people can run on new hardware when it comes out. Um, a similar clerical thing is just improving the device strings. So if you do like a, a D message or watch your boot logs, you should see a, a much more useful um, entry for any E1000 drivers now. Um, this is important because when we get PRs or when we're talking about bugs, um, we don't often get like a full package of information from the reporter. Um, you know, you might just get like a D message or a PCI conf L or whatever. Um, the latter is more useful because you can tell what the Mac type is, but um, in the case we're not getting that information, it, it's just, it's useful to get, to help the reporters understand what they're doing and that they're like, you know, a hundred different Macs in this driver and all of them have interesting quirks. Um, then the final thing here, uh, this 82.574 is, um, it was kind of a straddled like a workstation slash server uh, gigabit ethernet NIC like a decade ago. Um, this was pretty common in like high-end like Mac Pros and super microservers and stuff like that. Um, at my previous employment, we added uh, MQ multi-queue support to this. Um, it can support two queues and um, in the process of doing that, um, we missed a step of, uh, in the process of making it an MSIX thing, we missed um, the way that this handles link status changes. So um, I fixed that. And then while I was in there, I just cleaned up the, the general intent of um, link status changes for IGB as well. Um, I've got a few things in progress for hardware VLAN filter management. Um, this looks completely broken. Like, I don't think it actually works right now. Um, I think like if you have the capability enabled, you're actually not getting hardware filtering. Um, I, I have a pretty good handle on this. Um, it's just a time constraint thing for me. Like I only get an hour or two at a time to work on these issues. And it, that's generally not enough to make progress on some of these bugs. Um, but I will try and find some time in the, in the coming weeks to, to finish this. Um, this one's related, the TXRX cleanup. Um, there's some just, you have to move these flags around for like IPv6 in the hardware descriptors. Um, and that's different per Mac type. So the only way I, I knew how to do all this was just to go download like all the data sheets I could find for all of these cards and then, um, you know, try and make a table and figure out what's different. Um, I've got all that stuff on my, on a website now that I can give to people if they're interested in working on this stuff. It, it, it's pretty necessary for some of these bugs. Um, but I think the combination of these two will fix, uh, hardware VLANs and, um, I'll fix up TSO as well. I've done done some testing on that, but it's broken in the VLAN case still. Um, then there's a couple easy bugs I found um, 
uh, I'll fix these if nobody else is interested in doing it. Uh, wake on LAN. This is just um, a matter of moving the power management flags around correctly. Um, there, there's somebody in Bugzilla that has a proposed patch. Um, it needs some tweaks. Like it, we need to solve this holistically where we're, why and where we're setting these flags. Um, I think, you know, just like a handful of, of concentrated hours will get that bug fixed. Um, and then there's a patch for adding LED, LED uh, management back to, to this driver. Um, I haven't looked at the, the patch for that. It came in in the past month or so, um, but it might be ready to go. Um, on IXGBE, I've uh, just tried to do a couple of trivial cleanups. Most of them were like, I'm reading the driver and making changes to E1000. So um, if I saw something, I would run it by ERJ at Intel or whatever. Um, but I also improved the device strings here for the same reason. Um, we just want to know when we're getting PRs, what the card is, and um, that helps us fix bugs. Um, I'm trying to unify the TXRX in, uh, in these drivers. There's one for uh, EM class devices. Um, there's one for IGB class devices, and there's one for IXGBE. They're all fairly similar. Um, the descriptor format between IGB and IXGBE is somewhat similar. Um, it's quite different for the previous generations before that. So it's not like you can't like necessarily copy everything and consolidate it, but there is a lot of crossover here. Um, and I'm just trying to keep those things synchronized and um, easier to, to read if you're transitioning between the drivers. Um, then there's what I'm calling hard bugs. Um, we don't have TX aim support. The way transmission works and if lib is completely different than before. Um, I've looked pretty deeply at this problem and I, I have some thoughts on it um, that I'll talk about in the next slide, but I actually don't know what to do here. Um, I'm not sure how this should work. And then I've done testing with the RX aim and I don't like it. Like it doesn't, there's, knees where um, the performance just goes to, you know, bad situations um, versus the, the status quo of just having a fixed uh, ITR. Um, so we can't enable this by default right now. And like, I, don't, I actually would not recommend enabling that until we figure out how to do it correctly. Um, I don't know when I'll find time to, to work on that, but it, this is pretty important. Um, then, uh, if lib is a, a framework, um, there are some things we need to fix through here. So, um, there's documentation on how to write a driver in this, uh, next BSD wiki. Um, we need to just like go grab the content from there, do some improvement and turn it into man pages. I think that'd be the best course. Um, I'll commit to doing that. I just, I don't know when it's another time thing. Um, if anybody else wants to do it, any of the things I've described to you, just feel free to ping me and I, I'd be more than happy to give pointers or participate in reviews or whatever. Um, then I was working on a, a, a real tech driver for this 2.5 gig chipset. Um, this is difficult for kind of unfortunate reasons. Um, we don't have data sheets from Realtek and they're like extremely reluctant to, to give those out. Um, even as, you know, I, I asked if the foundation could serve as like the NDA signer and all that kind of stuff. And they're still hesitant to do it. Um, then I found out Kevlo, uh, who's a FreeBSD committer, um, is also an OpenBSD committer and wrote this driver called RGE that is running on net and OpenBSD. Um, it might be a better course of action to just use that driver because this hardware is finicky and the documentation is not available. Um, so at least we could team up with these other BSDs and get bug fixes going between them. Um, I'm not sure if I'll continue this project. Um, 
I, I switched over to the E1000 stuff after I found found that out just because it seemed more more important. Uh, then Peter Grehan has um, support for Intel's IGC. This is uh, a 2.5 gig part. It's extremely similar to IGB. Um, so there'll be a lot of crossover there uh, for bug fixes and uh, improvements and things like that. Um, I don't know when this will start showing up on hardware, but um, it seems like uh, this will be a common driver going forward on, on at least client platforms, um, if not embedded devices and stuff like that. Uh, then there's a few hard bugs. This is what I was hinting to earlier. So the, the primary problem um, in IFLib that I see right now is we combined um, the MSIX interrupt vectors for uh, transmission and receive. Um, there's good reasons to do this. Like you can't, you don't have an unlimited number of these vectors on common platforms. And say you have a bunch of NIC ports and a bunch of NVMe drives and a bunch of cores. Uh, it's it's plausible that you'll you'll run out of queues and that kind of thing. Uh, so Intel's guidance is let's use a combined handler. Um, it seems reasonable. The only thing that uh, needs to you know that that happened here is it, it's it's extremely hard to reason about when you rearm these gratuitous TX uh, interrupts. Um, I've looked at this pretty hard for you know like. A number of days and I couldn't figure it out. Um, that's more a limitation of myself than like a unfeasibility of this bug. I just, I don't, I'm new to some of this stuff and I'm trying to figure it out in my spare time. Um, I'd love to, to work with somebody on this and see if we can make that better. Um, my belief is UDP performance will go up uh, quite a bit once we fix this. Um, the over the, the the commentary over this is just we're we're arming TX interrupts um, up to the ITR value, um, and we really shouldn't need to do that. Like if things are are working as intended, we should be um, really not. We're pumping interrupts based on the the availability of work. That's the design model of the IFLIB data path. So um, the expectation would be you'd have like you know on a ten gig card maybe like a thousand interrupts a second or whatever, instead of 30,000 with the current ITR uh, per queue. Um, then the, this VLAN bridge offload interaction, um, I don't have a great handle on this yet. Um, this has come in from Grehan as well. I, I think what he's saying is we just need to, to move um, some of the capability flags around, like we probably need to disable offloads when you add a bridge. Um, I think some of the other NICs do this correctly, like uh, CXGBE manages all this stuff correctly. Um, you also have to do like promiscuous flag management and stuff like that. Um, I haven't even looked at this yet, but um, that's pretty important for our firewall users and that kind of thing, uh, virtualization users. Um, so that's the entirety of my talk. Um, I'm just going to keep whittling away at this stuff. Um, more than happy to share the workload with other people or learn from people if you know more about this than me. Um, that's pretty much it. Any questions? I think actually we're going to move on to the next one to try to okay. keep us going. Um, so next up we have Arka from Dell, who's going to talk about open channel SSD. So are you ready, Arka? Yeah. Okay, go for it. Is my screen visible to all? Yep. Yeah. Thanks, John. And uh, so a brief introduction. Uh, my name is Arka Sharma. And I have been working in Dell for last two years. And uh, I joined the Isolon project uh, last six months. And along with uh, my teammates on this project, Amit and Ashutosh, both are present in this uh, call. And our uh, presentation is regarding uh, the POC that we did uh, before joining in Isolon. Uh, and our goal was to learn more about uh, FreeBSD. 
and it is basically the PO, uh, basically a POC of open channel SSD. And our work is uh, we took reference from the Light and VM project, which is uh, the open channel SSD implementation in Linux. So that's it. And uh, let us start. I will I will cover a few basic uh, things regarding SSDs. Uh, so and then we'll uh, proceed with uh, the POC that we have done. So uh, maybe uh, many of you might be familiar, already familiar with this. So this is on the left hand side, we basically have a basic uh, block diagram of an SSD. And uh, the main component will be a host interface logic. So for example, it could be NVMe, it could be uh, SATA, it could be, uh, it could be SAS also. And in case of NVMe, it directly connects to PCI. So, uh, and then, uh, in the SSD controller, we typically have a processor which will be mostly a real-time processor, maybe Cortex R or uh, Risk V or other something like that. And we also have uh, RAM for caching purpose, and we also have uh, RAM for uh, basically the computation which is done inside the SSDs, as well as the map, L2P map, what we store, which we'll cover on the next slide. And then we'll have a flash interface uh, with which uh, the flash chips will be connected. So in the diagram here, we have uh, two channels here. So these two channels are uh, capable of uh, transferring data independently and parallelly. Uh, and in each of these two channels, what we see here is two flash packages are uh, connected, right? Now, you know, on a single channel, at a, at any given time, only one uh, flash package data transfer can happen. But once, this, once that data transfer is complete, then internally when the flash module is uh, running its internal command, then this channel becomes free and then we can use this co concurrently, right? On the right hand side, we have uh, internal, uh, or typically internal uh, diagram of a flash chip. And what we have here is a uh, chip is divided into dies. And these two dies are independently uh, programmable and readable also so i can i can use uh, program i can use uh, commands uh, simultaneously as, as long as uh, the data as you can see here is the that we have cache register when the data is the, there in the cache register and we can issue the nand specific command right so these two can happen parallelly so for example in die zero we have plane zero and plane one and uh, plane zero and plane one can have a flash program command simultaneously, or it, we can read simultaneously. And so this is called plane interleaving. And if we say, let's say if we have something like uh, flash package one is, uh, is doing a program and that time flash package uh, two is getting the data in its own internal cache register. So typically this uh, technique is called uh, chip interleaving. It depends from one literature to another, but uh, typically the uh, cheap interleaving and uh, plain interleaving is used. So our next slide is about uh, characteristics as well as the limitations of flash that uh, pre in the previous slide, we have seen that flash is divided into pages, right? So pages uh, consist pages, many, mul many pages creates a block and like with multiple blocks, we have a plane, or rather we should say that a flash chip is divided into dies and the die is divided into plane and the plane is divided into blocks, which indeed divided into pages. And the pages are basically the unit of read and write commands, flash read and write. And we cannot override the page un unless this page is erased. And it is again, has to be done on block granularity, right? And flash blocks typically will have a, a limited number of, e it is that we can perform on them. And uh, typically the single level SLC flash will have higher uh, erase cycles compared to MLC, which is uh, like a multi-level cell, like two bit we can uh, store in, in a single NAND, single cell. And in those pages, uh, typically the count will be somewhere ranging in thousands and which will be even uh, in case of TLC, which is a three bit per cell, uh, it will be even lesser, somewhere around multiple of hundreds. 
right that we could perform eras on them right and because of that the lifetime obviously is in case of tlc it is less in case of mlc it is little bit more and slc is more has more uh, lifetime okay and all these blocks we kind this lifetime is in a way define the lifetime of ssds right so typically towards the end of life the data that we read from the ssds we can get uh, Uh, more uh, frequent errors and all we can get program failure and this kind of failures we can see if uh, the ssd approaches its ol so to address this co concern so typically some sort of log structure uh, ftl is uh, maintained so ftl is a so software which does the flash translation which is running in the uh, ssd that we have seen earlier right so in in the in the ssd in the ssd that uh, the processor and uh, what we seen the ram and uh, the internal uh, component that we seen typically running the host interface uh, the host in hil commands as well as the ftls right so ftl typically will be like something implements like log structure uh, something similar to the log structure file system right so it will divide the blocks and some of the block it will mark them as log blocks so this log blocks will take incoming writes okay and we divide the address space the entire ssd address space into logical address space which is visible to the host and the physical address space which is visible to the nand and the physical address space is something like the address forms based on the flash geometry that we have seen in the flash internal uh, diagram right so ftl it typically map the logical address to physical address and it will also maintain the log structure system right so it will it will out of out of the all the blocks that it has so it will reserve some blocks as log blocks and these log blocks will take incoming writes okay and if there is any overwrite okay and uh, then in the l2p map right so we, where it is logical to physical map it will update the mapping right so say uh, a given page is uh, given lpn is mapped to a given ppn right and if there is a overwrite came from the host for on that lpn and uh, in obviously that data has to go in one of the log blocks so in that log blocks address will be updated in the l2p map so as we can see that so after the once a log block is full it will it will marked as a data block and over the time as more overwrites are coming from the host some of some of the pages some of the pages in the block will go stale and after a certain point we need to perform a garbage collection in order to uh, reclaim the block right so we will uh, copy the valid pages from those uh, victim uh, block for uh, garbage collection and we copy from a newly allocated destination block for garbage collection okay and uh, also we there is something like uh, over the time we also want to perform the erase operation in such a way that that it doesn't happen that certain blocks get more erase compared to others so we want to distribute the erase in a kind of uniform manner this this technique is called wear leveling so there are few uh, shortcomings are there with uh, traditional ssds uh, which are addressed i think one of the warner's uh, paper which he has addressed uh, this uh, tail latency problem uh, where the nda solution is proposed and also we have this uh, paper where the where the actually the light nvm solution is proposed right i'll quickly go over these problems right so that as we have seen all the operation all the ftl operation is happening within the ssd and host is host has absolutely no control on that right or it, it is not even aware there is there is underlying translation okay and we have also seen that uh, that log structure file system we have seen right and there are also many applications are there which implements already implements log structure uh, fashion right and also file system also will have something similar to that now what happens is if we have multiple log structure systems stacked on to uh, each other, each other then uh, at at for one layer the upper layers metadata is lower layers data but in case of ssd the entire since the host has no control we might be like 
using more like using more overrides and leading to garbage collection and also garbage collection when garbage collection happens it also uh, impacts the performance of the ssds because garbage collection involves uh, finding out the victim blocks and then copying the valid pages first of all determining the valid pages then copying the valid pages it is quite a intensive task which uh, warner has addressed using in his paper so all, for this concerns basically the uh, basically the main uh, concern here is that host not having the any control on the any of the data placement so the de decision is taken in the in this uh, approach the light nvm approach the idea here is let let us divide the responsibilities right so in the currently we have all the data placement media management which include the error detection and error recovery and the uh, uh, mapping and io io scheduling all the things are managed inside the ssds so here what we uh, decide to do is that some of the responsibilities we want to move it in the host side while some of the responsibilities we also want to maintain in the uh, device side now host will have host will be aware of the l2p mapping and since the host is aware of the l2p mapping it also has to be aware of the physical uh, layout of the nand right and henceforth we need uh, we need something to expose the underlying nand format the nand hierarchy including the its channels it pay, it uh, chips the dies the blocks the entire hierarchy we need to expose to the host right and so that host could take uh, host could take that address information and it, it can have if FTL responsibilities inside the host, right? That is all the open channel uh, SSD is all about. So open channel SSD also comes with the specification that I mentioned in my previous slide, which talks about the physical page interface, right? So it introduced something called vector IO, where we can, uh, in in different pages, we can we can perform one shot IO, be it read or write. Typically, uh, I had one slide regard showing the how the striping is performed so typically the uh, typically the target is created by uh, using parallel unit parallel unit is basically the chips what we have seen in earlier si slides i have also uh, i have also one diagram showing uh, in one of the slides later okay this is the one so this pu is basically it is the uh, ocssd uh, specs terminology for uh, chip that we have seen in slide uh, two. So uh, an user can create a target, OCSSD target using multiple PUs, okay? And once it once we do that, so our, the FTL layer will create the stripe so that it can take advantage of the multiple channel. And if, if the target is span across, spanning across two channels, then we could have uh, we could utilize that parallelism. And in case if the stripe, can, uh, if the target is built using the PUs on a single channel, then we could only uh, take advantage of the interleaving. But how in, in both the cases, uh, the FTL will attempt to uh, take, uh, make a best effort to perform the uh, to take advantage of the concurrency or underlying concurrency and the parallelism depending on your uh, target configuration so we have uh, so in our poc we have used uh, the kemu we created a uh, we downloaded that uh, kemu uh, that ocssd enabled kemu and uh, we bo we used uh, freebsd 12.1 and uh, there we implemented a uh, this POC, right? So our our POC largely similar to the light NVM that we have in Linux, but obviously being the uh, I/O interfaces are different and the BIOs are a little different compared to FreeBSD and Linux, and so those changes are there. So this is typically the stack that uh, we have inserted our layer. So uh, we have introduced two layers. Uh, one is light NVM and one is PBLK. So the PBLK is the pluggable FTL layer. So we, if we want, we can implement other FTL algorithms and we can plug into the light NVM. 
Uh, the rest of the stack remains same. We made minor changes in the NVMe to accommodate the vector commands. And this is a little bit more detailed uh, diagram. So typically our, uh, this is the light NVM uh, layer. So it sits in the same level as NVD. And uh, it will create a disk interface, which will interface with geom. And while, while you create a target, like we give the, like I said, we give the, the PUs that we want to create the target with. And we also mention what sort of FTL we want to have on it, right? So typically we currently have only one implementation, which is PBLK. So the GEOM will call the strategy and uh, it will be accepted, intercepted by this uh, disk interface. And then it will uh, forward to our PBLK and this PBLK where our FTL logic will run. So it will in involve uh, lookup. It will involve if there is any bad block, uh, then uh, it encounter any bad block, it will be remapped. All the FTL responsibilities will be performed in the PBLK, including GC. And once it resolved the physical address, it will, uh, pass this call to our uh, NVM core or light NVM and which in turn will call the existing uh, NVMe driver that we have. We just added this light NVM to incorporate the vector commands. And then this uh, part largely the same that done interface, it will NVM done and then it will call PBLK done. And from there we'll have the BIO done. And uh, so I would like to give a quick uh, overview of the the module of the, that we have in the PBLK. So in PBLK, we have a cache. The cache size is 20, uh, 256 slots. And each slot is currently holding 4K data. And uh, for any write command, the data will go to the cache. And we have a writer thread scheduled and that K thread will uh, pick up the, uh, Pick up the slot, pick up the uh, field up slot from the cache, and it will uh, send it to the. It, it will basically do a lookup and then send it to the NVM core and basically send it to the NAND. So we maintain the L2P me metadata in three places. One is in the RAM, and uh, in two places in the NAND we maintain. So for each block, we reserve the last 40 pages as the L2P map. It is basically a hash map or uh, associative array, I should say. And also when we write pages, so mostly all flash vendors will provide some spare area for each pages. So we'll also write the LPN in those spare area. So the idea here is that if a block and also in most of the cases, the, especially the MLC and TLC NAND, they allow the pages to be written in a block sequentially. So I cannot write uh, block n plus one before I write block n. So that's why I cannot write the for last 40 pages without filling the block. So in that case, like let's say uh, one block is half filled and uh, and we need to, we, we face a shutdown, be it normal shutdown or abrupt shutdown. And uh, since we have in, the, in that block, since we have the, uh, LPN information in the spare area, in the spare, spare, we could we could scan the block and rebuild the map, right? In the, when the system is booting up. So obviously this will enhance some, increase the time to some extent, right? So let's go to the next. And uh, this is what, this is how the uh, device that NAND geometry looks like. And it is uh, basically the thing that I was talking about earlier. So we have two channels which are independently, it can be multiple channels actually. So suppose, uh, let's let's consider this use case. So we have two channels here, zero, one, two, three, let's number them and four, 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 five, six, seven, right? And I can choose to create a OCSSD uh, target with only one parallel unit. In that case, obviously there will be no striping I can create two parallel unit. In that case, there will be striping with interleaving. I can create four. In that case, only interleaving is possible. Or I could create uh, with all eight. 
or i could also have something like this like 0 1 and 4 5 so in that case also we have interleaving as well as channel parallelism so this is how the address is divided and each address is divided with a logical so actually if you see the ocss spec the terminology is kind of misleading here so this offset is basically the even though they call it logical block it is basically a page offset inside a block the chunk is basically the block id inside a parallel unit and parallel unit is basically the the parallel unit in a channel and group is basically the channel okay so this is the format of the ppa so in each so we have seen in our current nvme implementation we uh, typically give the prp ad, prp which is the buffer descriptor and in uh, we also provide the start lba and number of lba so here it will be the command will be vector command vector read or write and buffer descriptor prp remains the same and number of blocks also remains the same but the start lba here instead of one single lba it will be an array of pps okay so future work is basically we could not complete the garbage collection path and uh, that is what we want to do and uh, then we need to do a performance analysis with the traditional nvme ssds and we also thought about having ftl as a geom class i'm not sure how practical is this but it is kind of like we thought of and then we also thought thought of having this ftl to move in user space and try to see if it is possible to interface with user space nvme drivers and not a few open bugs are there and one of them is basically that uh, some uh, that cache some pointer in the cache some index in the cache we are facing that uh, bug is basically it could be the problem with the kemu also i'm not sure that uh, that index when we are printing when we are basically facing that inconsistency we are printing that index value in the telnet and whatever the value we are getting and in the gdb stub when you are examining that value we, those two values are different and we are always seeing a consistent difference so this is the current status and uh, there are a few good lessons that we learned that is basically obviously with the we got familiarization with the free bsd and uh, we got more uh, comfortable with the kernel debugging and uh, topics like geom and all so i think that's all uh, that i had and i have attached a few uh, attached a video and i don't think i don't have time to play yeah, it. We'll, we'll not be able to do the video today but maybe um if you uh, have a set of your slides you can share with me i could probably post a link to it on the wiki that folks can see if you have a version you can share publicly uh yeah sure 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 okay well, thanks thank you thanks much. and sorry for overstretching it little <laughs> that, that's okay um so thanks arca so next up um ah, my goodness check the schedule next up we have charlie to talk about GNU radio are you ready charlie i am ready so right. uh Yep. Um, yeah. So hello, everyone. Yes, I'm Charlie. Um, that's my uh, FreeBSD uh, login there. Um, just uh, kind of a kind of a rookie committer, but uh, but I've been uh, doing a lot of uh, ports work, mostly in the on the desktop side of things, and a little bit on the ham radio side of things as well. So uh, so yeah, welcome to the conference room. I've got some. Uh, although uh, I've got some equipment lined up here. Here's a uh, here's a uh, software defined uh, radio to hack RF. And you know, we got an antenna and we've got, you know, this uh, handy talkie, this handheld radio. We're not going to be able to use any of it today, unfortunately, because what we are going to talk about, which is the GNU radio port, uh, it did not finish building in time for this, uh, for this little, uh, um, for this little presentation. So unfortunately, we will not be able to see, you know, some of the stuff in action and uh, power the radio on, but uh, we'll, but uh, I guess in this case, we will just kind of explain a little bit of just uh, some of the challenges, some of the pitfalls, and maybe if there are any uh, budding uh, ports contributors out there who might want to maintain, pick up some ports or, uh, or interested otherwise in picking up some ports, 
just uh, something, a little case study of uh, just how to do things, some pitfalls and uh, best practices. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here uh, to the correct window. And here we go. As long as it shows up. There we go. So welcome, also welcome to the uh, the Cinnamon desktop environment on uh, on FreeBSD. I also maintain that as part of the desktop team, the GNOME team. That's besides the point. But uh, here's a little. Uh, so this is my uh, my personal uh, GitLab. I put up the uh, work in progress port um, updating GNU Radio to three point nine point one point zero. That's the latest version from upstream. The uh, the current version in ports, as you can see here, that's three point eight point one point zero. That's a little old. Uh, the age is not so much the issue as as the uh, the long list of dependencies and the mess that that it was. Um, I'm currently in dark mode, uh, so it might be a little hard to see for all of these. Uh, I apologize for that, but uh, I'm a dark mode person, so that's you have to deal with it. But uh, but really, you know, when when you're when you're going to update a port. You know, like you, you always, especially when you're picking one up that you really haven't touched before or either haven't touched for quite a while, you definitely want to do an audit of all your, uh, all the dependencies that are, uh, that you're specifying or, or has specified in this case. And uh, it's specified quite a lot. And um, after this little, uh, you know, this whole process of updating the support, there are quite a few dependencies that were just, that are just completely irrelevant now. Uh, for example, I will, I will highlight why was why was the Guile one? Guile one was still specified in GNU Radio three point eight when that that dependency probably disappeared long ago. Uh, in fact, if you even try to install what's currently in ports right now, and and you have something that used Guile two, guess what? That Guile two stuff is gone. That, that Guile 2, like PKG will say, do you also want to uninstall everything that depends on Guile 2? So, um, so that's an issue. Someone actually on the, on the upstream project reported a, an issue that, um, that they actually needed to build the, uh, the, the bleeding edge Git version of GNU Radio because they tried to install the one from ports, which is pre-built, and it actually uninstalled GNOME for it on them. So, you know, audit your dependencies often, especially if you haven't touched them in a while. So we, we clean this up, clean this up a lot. Um, GNU Radio in the past used Python 2. That's long gone as well. We got rid of Python 2 in the, uh, in the ports repository uh, for the most part, except for a couple of, for a couple of uh, items. But uh, yeah, so right now uh, GNU Radio uses, completely uses Python 3. Uh, all Python 3 components, even the old uh, GNU Radio Companion, which is the GTK um, graphical user interface for it, that, that's optional even. Uh, even that one uh, had migrated from PyGTK2 all the way to uh, PyGOptic3, which uses GTK3. So that's good. And what else do we have? We also cleaned up a lot of these uh, CMake arguments. So GNU Radio uses CMake as its as it's a build driver, and and um, it, it's a, it's a little their CMake list behaves rather erratically, um, for lack of a better phrase. They, uh, they they actually enable everything by default, and you actually have to disable the whole enable default uh, path that they have you go on in order to make it behave itself. And then uh, and then so now we can specify exactly what we want to enable and what we don't want to enable. And uh, yeah, so WX widgets, that dependency had not been there for a while either. So that's gone. And then uh, I'm probably gonna have to continue to clean up this lib strip part. And uh, there's some options. Yeah, so the options we cleaned up, we now just have the docs option, which will, uh, which just generates the docsygen documentation. Uh, what else do we have? We have a UHD. Uh, we have to go down here. There we go. Yeah, so we just have docs, and, and we're going to optionalize the, the two GUIs, which is the GRC, the GNU Radio Companion, and the Q5 GUI. They're, they're going to be options uh, not enabled by default in case uh, someone wants to run, run a headless, which you can totally run this headless. Uh, there's a little testing framework that you can enable, and then we've always had the UHD option, which is just another uh, radio library. 
um, that uh, for certain uh, certain hardware radios out there. And then we also have uh, the zero MQ as an option uh, for, I, I'm not exactly sure what that does, but, uh, but uh, we, we can see about that later. So there are the options we clean, doing a lot of this uh, cleanup here with uh, making sure all the proper dependencies are in the proper options. And um, yeah, update the dist info, some patch cleanups as well. And then we're not gonna load this diff because yeah, the, the, the P list is long and you don't wanna see that. Uh, so, so yeah, so that's the, that's the, um, what I have so far for this port. This will go up on Fabricator at some point. Uh, and I'll also send out a uh, further call for testing on some mailing list, probably the BSD ham one, but maybe even the ports mailing list as well uh, for anyone who might want to try it out or, or who might be a radio or wireless hacking inclined. They might want to try it out. Go ahead and try it out. The, the one thing that I do have a fabricator in support of it is, uh, so one of its de main dependencies is libvolk or devil slash volk. Uh, that's going to get updated 2.5.0. They actually just released it like a couple of days ago. Um, it's actually ready to ready to go as is, apparently, uh, according to my uh, my ports mentors and uh, Yuri, who is a fellow ham radio project member. Uh, so if you're going to test out the uh, test out the new radio port when I put it up somewhere, that's not this like GitLab instance. Uh, you will also need to you also need to import this this uh, live bulk update uh, because they're kind of meant to, they're kind of meant to run together, uh, so to speak. Uh, what else is there? So yeah, that's, um, so one of the, one of them, so really the only thing I have left to do on this, uh, on this port here, uh, before we do the whole call for testing, uh, we're going to flavor, we're going to flavorize the two, um, the, the two graphical user interfaces. So if I scroll back down here, if I can do so, there we go. So we're, we're going to flavorize the GRC and the Q5 options so that when you, uh, so that once the package builders uh, build everything, you'll actually see, you'll actually be able to see uh, three different ports, well, three different packages, depending on what you want. You, you'll have the regular GNU radio package, which will, uh, which will just be everything that you can, uh, that, that you need to run a headless. And then the GRC flavor, which is which is just that plus the plus the uh, GNU Radio Companion user interface, aka the GTK interface, and then we'll have the GNU Radio Q5 uh, flavor, which is just that except for the except change out the GTK interface with the Q5 interface. So they they have they they have these options here. And what's also kind of annoying about having to offer it like this is that it, it it's kind of like how we do the Git port. You know, like so, you have the you have the Git port with with the regular with the regular you know full featured Git, and then we have Git Lite, we have Git Tiny, and then we have a couple others. But the, it's all from the same code base. Very much, very much going to be the same deal here with GNU Radio, especially since how they architected the build is that you have to build everything from the from the top from the top level directory, and you, you, like you you can't just build each individual component yourself. Or, or by itself for that matter. So that's just something annoying and something that, uh, you know, that, that's why we're gonna flavorize it that way. Uh, so yeah, that's really all I have when it comes to this work in progress of the you know, radio port. And, um, and really just, uh, I guess, wrap things up, you know, yeah, just look out for the call for testing when, when, uh, when it comes out, hopefully later this week, maybe over the weekend. And, um, and when that does, if um, if any of you have your amateur radio license, uh, yeah, this is a, this is a great way to exercise your uh, privileges. And if any of you don't have your amateur radio license, if you are in the U.S. or have some way of obtaining a U.S. mailing address, we are having a remote testing session, a fully remote testing session for amateur radio U.S. amateur radio licenses on Sunday, on Sunday afternoon, 1600 hours Eastern time. Um, I will be there as one of the, uh, one of the hosts, one of the volunteer examiner hosts. Um, even though it says Southeast Linux Fest exam, we are co-branding it officially as the Southeast Linux Fest and FreeBSD Developer Summit uh, remote testing session. Um, I will post that, uh, I'll post that link somewhere, I think in the chat and then I think John or whoever else can get that over to uh, elsewhere as well. 
but I'll get that on the get that here. That's the that's the link if anyone wants to register for the uh, for the session. Uh, and then uh, once you get your uh, license, uh, the next week you can go ahead and uh, exercise your privileges on uh, on frequencies that you didn't have access to before, uh, which is how you can use the handy talkie or the or the other radio. So um, yeah, that's all I've got. So uh, thanks everyone for uh, for for watching and um, yeah, look out for the call for testing. Cool. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, Next, we have Cyril, or Cyril, sorry, who's to talk about RunJ experiments. Hello, uh, can you guys see my presentation? Yes, perfect. Okay, great. Um, so hi, I'm Cyril. I am a co-op student working for the FreeBSD Foundation. So um, today I'm just going to talk about what I'm currently working on during my co-op term. Um, so a little bit of context so we, I can explain the motivation behind what I'm doing. Um, containers, a container is OS level virtualization. So think like Docker and on Linux, they've got um, containers. I think they're just called containers. And on FreeBSD, what we have are uh, jails. And um, this is often described as like, like true, but better. Um, so uh, we've got containers across all different uh, kinds of systems. And so of course there is this um, open container initiative that uh, has a specification, a spec that will standardize uh, these containers, how they're used basically um, with container runtimes. So I put this quote here that I just took off the OCI website that explains um, kind of like uh, what their uh, spec standardizes. And the important part is um, the end. At this point, the OCI runtime bundle would be run by an OCI runtime. So um, what I've been working on is um, this OCI runtime. Um, it is a like a program that um, you give it a runtime bundle and it runs it, at, it as a container. So for example, on FreeBSD, uh, it would run the runtime bundle as a jail. Um, so first on Linux, what do they have? They have a program called run C, um, made by the people at Docker. Uh, so this is just a program that is, um, compatible, uh, fully compliant with the OCI runtime spec. And it's got support for, uh, Linux specific things too, like namespaces and C groups. And the reason for that is actually because those things are in the OCI specification. So I've attached a picture here of the um, Linux uh, specific page from the specification. So they have um, a platform specific configuration options in the spec. So they have it for Linux and Windows and Solaris, but they don't have one for FreeBSD yet. Um, so what is it like on FreeBSD? So on FreeBSD, we kind of um, have this project called RunJ, which is supposed to be a Run C equivalent. Uh, it's currently in development by Samuel Karp. And so it doesn't support everything yet. Um, but uh, adding the remaining general OCI um, specification should be straightforward. Um, but the more interesting thing is that the spec doesn't have dedicated FreeBSD um, configuration options. So um, if we only followed the OCI spec, then it could be kind of limited because um, there might be some functionality that FreeBSD supports that isn't in the specification. So should we design a specification um, that is specific for FreeBSD? Or maybe the question would be better worded as if we were to design it, uh, what kind of things would we add to this, this spec? And so that is kind of the question that I've been thinking about um, currently. Um, that's what I'm doing. And so I'll give an example here. Um, so you mentioned how I mentioned, you remember how I mentioned um, two slides back that uh, run C has support for C groups. And so that is like um, that on Linux is what you can use to limit the resources that a container can use. Um, so for example, you can limit memory usage or CPU usage of a container. And on FreeBSD, we actually have something that we can also, we can use to also do that. We have something called our account, which you can use to easily set resource limits uh, per jail. Um, and although like the OCI specification has um, our limits uh, 
in the in the configuration that's like per process. So if we could use our account instead, that could give us um, more more power, more configuration. And so that was one of the things that I was doing was thinking about um, adding uh, our controls. So our control is the program that you uh, that you use. Uh, to set the limits, uh, the R account limits. Um, and so I kind of did like an experimental add uh, R control to RJ and see how that works, how that works out. It was pretty simple. I just put a screenshot here. I know this is super out of context, so it doesn't really mean much, but there's the screenshot there. Um, and so you can see that um, you can specify what resource that, what our account resource you want to limit and the limit. Um, and the interesting thing is it doesn't stop there. Um, there are like other questions come out of this, such as like, do we want to support all our account limits? Because some of them don't actually make sense um, to apply per jail. Some limits would only make sense like per user or per process or something. So does it make sense to um, say in the spec that all, uh, all our account limits will be supported or are we going to define only a subset of our account limits that will be supported? For example, um, uh, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, uh, sorry. But um, yeah, so as you can see this work is mostly um, thinking about questions, not much programming, but more like thinking and researching and discussing with other people. So that is just like a little slice of what I've been doing. Um, that is the end of my presentation. Cool, thank you very much, Cyril. Uh, I think up next we have, if I can find the right tab. Uh, up next we have Yang, who also is an intern with the FreeBSD Foundation, um, who's going to talk about um, installer prototyping. Okay, everything showing up properly? Yep. All right. Great. Uh, hello. Oh yeah, my name is Yang, and I'm also a very similar to zero situation. I'm a co-op intern at the FreeBSD Foundation, and I've been working on an installer that uses like uh, I'll just show you a screenshot. It uses a browser uh, form as input, and so uh, current I'm basing it off of uh, Ryan Moeller's sort of work on on the prototype. I've been just adding additional parts to that. And so the motivation for something like this is that the current uh, FreeBSD installer, which is BSD install, uses like a terminal dialog interface and it's somewhat unwieldy and there's, and, there, and I see people talking about there's issues with it asking some like strange questions that maybe not be familiar to uh, new users to FreeBSD. And so this is sort of um, a way to try to make an installer that is friendlier and also uh, more uh, full featured and easy to use. And so having this, these browser UI elements sort of help with that because they're a very familiar and also accessible, have very standard sort of navigation even without the mouse. And so I've been working on, here's another screenshot, adding some very early on work to stuff like the, the keyboard configuration, which would can dynamically change and you can type type uh, it to, to see if it works down there. And so, you know, while, while I am here, I'm doing some other thinking about installers and about the, their usability. And I, one, one issue I came up with for BSD install is that you would enter in something like your, your disks and your, your, your partitions and your network, and then the, it would sort of stop you and you had to sit there for five minutes and it's, unpacking and installing everything. And then you, it goes back and prompts you to ask for the users and stuff. And so, so for the idea for this one is that instead of doing that, you would do all the configuration work first and then it would do the install. And sort of in the middle, what I would want to have is a sort of config file that the, the installer front end would write to and then the, the actual installing program would just read out the config file. And the benefit of that would be that we can have simpler ins installations that use scripts. And we can also plug in other sort of installation front ends easily. And BSD install does have a, a config for, for, for installing um, automatically, but it's very sort of, um, what's the word for it? It's very free, free flowing where you, you, you configure your disks, but then the rest of it is basically just a, 
the big old uh, shell script that you have to type yourself to set everything up. And so as you can, you can probably tell the work is very early on in initial stuff. I've just mostly been thinking about how I want to structure the, the, the front end of it. I've been work, doing a bit of JavaScript work to get the, get these sort of network configuration stuff going. And here you can, here's the link for the Ryan Moller's um, early work on it. I, I forgot to put my own uh, repository there, but I've been basing it off of that. And I, one of the things I've been thinking about was how to sort of limit my use of JavaScript in this, because it seems sort of to me that sort of the, if, if the more I use it, the, the, the more complicated everything becomes and unmaintainable. So I've been thinking a lot about the, the, the big picture stuff there. And yeah, so it would be very helpful to me if anyone has any sort of thoughts on the installers in general and what they would, what, what their opinions are, what they, what their experiences are, it would be really helpful if you contact me. I did not put my email on this, but it's uh, yzong at freebsdfoundation.org. Uh, uh, that, that, is, that is all. That's... Cool, thank you very much. Up next, we have Christoph, who's volunteered to talk about PF, because he hasn't done that enough today. Yeah, yeah well, sorry, I'll, I'll try to keep it short. Uh, there is some ongoing work in PF. Um, there are three main points that I wanted to cover. Uh, the first is that there's uh, ongoing work to change the way PF configuration is done, specifically the, the IOCTAL layer. It used to be that PF just shared uh, structure definitions between what it used in, in the kernel and how it got configured. That got split up not too long ago uh, as part of the counter work, uh, but that's still not ideal uh, because anytime you try to add new features, you want to change a structure definition and you, you get into ABI issues. Uh, so I've converted a number of uh, IOCTAL commands uh, to use NV lists. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to expand on the advantages of NV lists here, but uh, it does mean that we can add fields uh, without breaking user space. Uh, so that's ongoing. Uh, as part of that, I introduced libpfctl, which wraps these NV list uh, interactions into functions. There's a port for that library because I don't want the base system to have to give uh, library uh, stability guarantees because then we're straight back into the problem where we can't extend the API easily. Um, there is a port. Uh, the expectation is that ports that interact with PF programmatically, so ports that use the IOCTAL interface uh, they should look at migrating to the library uh, because sooner or later I'm going to remove the old IOCTALs, uh, well, from 14. They will, of course, remain in 13 and 12. Uh, but the old style is going to go away at some point. Uh, I, uh, not all uh, commands have been converted so far. I expect to convert them uh, as we add features to things. So this is a you know, long-term project, but it's ongoing. Uh, that is part of work that is sponsored by NetGate, by the way. As is the next topic, uh, I'm working on uh, trying to make PF use dummy net. So right now for packet queuing, packet scheduling, uh, we have alt queue, which is old and not enabled by default and doesn't work on all hardware for complicated and boring drivers. Uh, API reasons. Uh, the intention, the hope is that we can get PF to just use dummy nuts, uh, and then we will have one packet queuing scheduling framework in the kernel uh, used by uh, both IPFW and PF. That's very much ongoing work, um, but you know, it's ongoing. Uh, I, I hope to make some real progress on that soon. A uh, final topic is work that's sponsored by Modirum, uh, and that is porting PF SYN cookie support. Uh, a while ago, OpenBSD took FreeBSD SYN cookie support uh, from the network stack itself, and they moved it into PF. 
And now I'm looking at porting that work from OpenBSD SPF to FreeBSD SPF. Uh, just today, I managed to get that uh, to the point where uh, at least the basic test case worked. Uh, there's quite a lot of work left to be done, uh, but well, that, that too is, is ongoing. Um, that's basically everything I had. I see one question. Uh, did I change Dominant to support more than four gigabits per second? No, I did not. Okay, <clears throat> thanks, Christoph. Up next, we have Constantine to talk about uh, like various topics. Uh, AMD64 boot to kernel handoff, if I runtime, and kernel uh, address layout renderization. Interesting. Uh, thank you. John, do you hear me? Yes, I do. Okay. I hope everybody else also hear me. So basically, uh, let me share the. Uh, uh, Oops. Do you see slides now? Yep. Okay. So basically, that's, this is not a talk about the work in progress. Actually, this is a talk about work that is currently not in progress. And I'm trying, we'll try to explain why. Uh, what uh, uh, I realized that it should be explained because Today, I wanted to make two absolutely identical notes during two talks. One was about bootloader, another was during the mentioning of KSLR. We have an ongoing problem in the boundary between AMD64 bootloader and kernel. And it is important enough that it uh, affects actually <clears throat> a lot of different parts of the system. Basically, of course, it affects the low level kernel code and uh, uh, PMAP bootstrap that creates the uh, uh, initial kernel patch tables. But also it affects, for instance, runtime services for EFI. It affects the possibility of implementation of KEXEC. It also affects this uh, ever important thing like uh, KLSR. Uh, so, um, what is it? Uh, how kernel starts on AMD64? We uh, put kernel, kernel text and data in the a part of kernel in, at the kernel load um, address, physical address. It is currently defined at, as uh, two megabytes. Uh, after that, mode of the CPU is set to 64 bit, and we create initial uh, Preboot page tables which map each one gig uh, of low memory to all one gig uh, uh, entries in the kernel virtual address space. Basically, the low one gigabyte of physical memory is identically mapped to all uh, virtual all terabytes of kernel virtual address space. And then we jump to low core, which uh, create initial boot stack calls hammer time, and then we bootstrap them up and have a more or less running kernel configuration. So the big problem there is that we put the kernel at two megabytes uh, of physical memory. This, this is Practically, this works now, but theoretically, it is incompatible with many configurations. For instance, this memory might be claimed by EFI for runtime services. For KXX, the same memory should be used by the ongoing kernel. We can't just replace it, so we have to would need to implement something like uh, uh, a trample line that double copy the incoming kernel. It should be put somewhere, then trample line is run, then trample line override existing kernel with the new kernel. Similar, similarly, it cannot be used if anything like SLR is implemented because we put kernel at fixed physical address that then have phys, uh, fixed uh, virtual, sorry, virtual mapping. 
So uh, this stuff is actually uh, is quite central despite being very low level. And uh, first time I look at it, it is when I implemented, uh, when uh, the initial support for FE booting was implemented, but at the time, um, the, the again, another trampoline was done, which copied, double copied kernel somewhere, then trampoline copied kernel at the required uh, location in physical memory. Similar pro problem was with implementation of EFRT. Again, if we override any uh, runtime reserved memory, we can't have runtime services at the kernel runtime. So how to solve it? First, kernel need to be made relocatable. And uh, second, uh, somebody would need to do this relocation. It is more complex relocation that the car that currently done for the kernel. We just add some addends uh, in not too many places. But we would need a much more advanced kernel relocator. And it is not clear where this relocator should be uh, put in the boot code itself or in the kernel. Uh, also additional detail that uh, uh, resulting kernel still needs to be linked for, compiled and linked for the kernel memory model, which only allows to use the upper two gigabytes of uh, virtual address space for text. And the, uh, why it is now the question why it is not done yet? Because it, uh, I cannot imagine a way to implement it without uh, changing the uh, interface between bootloader and kernel. We uh, need to change both how kernel put in memory and how it is relocated and probably change the format of the kernel uh, file and disk itself. So uh, whatever we do, it probably will be a flag day for all users. It would need to have a new loader to boot a new kernel. So it is a problem and uh, uh, this problem uh, stops me from doing this change uh, in any uh, nearest time. I, I'm open to suggestion what to suggestions what to do and how to ease these transitions, but uh, I think we will need to do something about it. And especially when a EFE system become uh, more important and uh, uh, we will want to provide EFE runtimes on more machines where uh, the requirements of the uh, BIOS will be conflicting with our existing memory map. That's mostly it. Okay. Thanks, Constantine. Let's see, we might have, oh, we have a couple of questions. Did you want to take a stab at those? Uh, the first one, um, someone has asked, which EFI runtime services does FreeBSD use? Well, first, uh, most important, practically most important is probably EFI runtime variables editor that allows you to set up the boot booting. But uh, we have other things like you can use the FE interface to the um, <coughs> smooth uh, time uh, timekeeping uh, and so on. So we do use them. Uh, second question, is it possible to have two loaders installed? I I think practically it means that uh, one loader would need to support both kind of kernels, uh, old and new. But it is, I, I didn't uh, so hard about it, but it is something that uh, would still require uh, some attention and the configuration ch changes from user. I don't know. Really. Can you have a new loader that can load new and old kernels? Yes, that's basically that what I'm saying, but it, uh, uh, it, as I said, it's, it would still not that uh, easy or painless as, uh, as could be hoped for. 
no more, John, no more questions for me. So I'm okay. Done. Thank you, Constantine. So our last talk for today uh, is Ed Mast is going to be talking about updates to LDB. All right, so this, this uh, presentation was uh, put together by the Moritz Systems uh, folks um, who are, were not able to join. Um, so I'll just present the, the status update um, and where we're gonna go next. Uh, uh, so this is just uh, about Moritz um, and the foundation funded uh, Moritz to do the um, work on, on LLDB. Um, some background about uh, about LLDB. Uh, I think folks generally know this. We've been using LLDB and FreeBSD for quite a while now, um, and it's uh, it's become it's 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 increasingly usable as um, a uh, a debugger. Uh, when we first added it, it was quite experimental and had a lot of rough edges. Um, and uh, for user land at this point, um, it's, it's in pretty good shape now. Um, this is the work that uh, um, we've had more its take on. Um, so let's see here. The the first uh, big task is when LDB, LLDB was originally created, it came from um, Apple. It was uh, um, a Darwin um, uh, slash iOS slash um, Mac OS uh, debugger. And the design um, was in, it was designed uh, with that in mind um, and implemented as a inherently client server uh, debugging model. So in its, its sort of you know primary reference target, it would always run the debug target under a debug server um, and communicate with it. Uh, and the, the debugger front end um, basically communicated with the, the debug stub to, to do all of its actions. And one of the interesting things about that is that it gives you um, very, uh, it, it means that your local and remote debugging uh, experiences um, is identical. You don't, you're not gonna have cases where um, you're debugging a process on the same, uh, same machine in the same, um, having the debug, the debug process running in the same process as the debugger is not gonna be different from doing a remote debug session. Um, but the original um, port of LLDB functionality to Linux um, didn't use that model. And uh, uh, on Linux, it was deep, it, it ran the, the debug E in the, same, um, in the same process. And when that work was ported uh, to FreeBSD as well, it, um, it, it inherited that design. So Linux and FreeBSD originally um, uh, originally operated that way. Uh, so using in-process debugging um, for debugging on the same device or remote debugging, um, if you have a, you know, a, some other debug stub that you can connect to. And the Linux, uh, Linux LLDB debug, uh, developers implemented uh, two-process uh, client-server debugging some time ago, um, and FreeBSD was left as basically the only um, target that was still using the the in-process um, space. So, you know, originally it was a shared Linux and FreeBSD implementation, um, and was maintained uh, by Linux people as well. Um, but when once they completed the work to move the Linux uh, target support to use the client-server implementation, we were left as the only consumers of the the old and undesired approach. Um, and so uh, Moritz implemented FreeBSD support for the, um, uh, the client server model. Uh, that's, that, that was um, uh, last year. This year, uh, they've added uh, Im significantly improved support for ARM64 on FreeBSD and um, uh, sort of did a best effort um, approach of bringing up support for all of the other architectures. The, um, the 
non x86 um non-arm support in lldb for freebsd um, and for linux for that matter um uh, is uh, is not sort of um necessarily all that well tested or uh, or well used um so the migrating to the client server model and, and updating it you know has uh as a side effect um gotten some more test coverage and some some more review um, on those architectures but really the um, the target uh, support of interest is is really x86 and arm um, and so as it says at the bottom here the the old um, uh, single process model has now been completely removed um, and only the the client server model remains um, GDB um, has uh, support for uh, following either the, the forked uh, child or parent, um, and uh, LLDB lacked that uh, that originally, um, and so that's that's supported now. Uh, one future um, uh, addition would be to have the ability to follow both. Um, so basically have the debug session split into two um, upon a fork and be able to, to choose what you do with the parent or, or child. But at, at, the, at least now um, you can uh, continue debugging in the parent or switch and, and debug in the child. Um, a lot of work, um, uh, a lot of work done on core dumps um, and this resulted in some improvements in FreeBSD kernel um, as well uh for having um so as a result of this work uh there's kernel support for creating a user land core dump on demand um which is uh, basically a kernel um kernel support for what gcore provides and one of the benefits this has is that uh the same code gets used to create uh, core dumps on demand as as is used for um creating core dumps in response to a signal so uh it means that there's the 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 core dump that's written is is going to be consistent um, uh, between the two. Uh, one of the big things that came out of this work, um, though, also from what Moritz did, is that the tests uh, are much improved for core dumps at this point. Uh, lots of bug fixes um, and. Uh, uh, the, the test suite in on LLDB for a long time, even on Linux, um, was somewhat flaky, um, or at least some small portion of the tests were somewhat flaky. Um, the um, uh, the tests are at a point now where they're either consistently um, uh, passing, or at least are identified and, and known um, as flaky or or marked as um, uh, uh, marked as expected failures. Uh, and then what we're looking at. Uh, investigating for future work um, is bringing kernel debugging support. Um, uh, so right now, LLDB doesn't have any ability to uh, to debug either kernel core files or uh, live kernel debugging, and so we're evaluating that uh, as the next steps. So I think, John, that's uh, what I have for that. Okay. Well, thank you to all of our work in progress session speakers today um, for your talks. And thank you for all of our attendees for our, uh, being on our thing to our, uh, on our Dev Summit today. Clearly, I'm in need of some lunch. Uh, we will see you all tomorrow for our third and final day of the Developer Summit. Uh, if folks want to hang out in the hallway track, you're welcome to do so. I'll probably be there after I grab some lunch. Um, maybe if Warner is around, we'll talk about uh, process stuff. But otherwise, I'll see you all tomorrow morning. So thanks all.